Sure. Yep. Okay, well, for our final talk of the afternoon, it's my pleasure to introduce Matt Young, who will be talking about real categorical representation theory in topology and physics. <clears throat> Great, so thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed listening to all the talks and attending the ones that kind of the time allowed. So it's, it's nice to have something like this when there's not that much else going on. So today uh, I'm going to talk about some well collection of, of works, some of which are joint with uh, Bering Nui and Dmitry Ruminin. So I'll kind of indicate as we go along uh, who did what. And so just to give a, a rough overview of what we'll do in the talk and kind of what the point of the talk is, uh, since in the end it's somehow not a talk about representation theory, but rather about uh, what representation theory can say about topology and maybe vice versa. So we start with a, let's just say finite group for this talk is enough to understand all of the ideas. Okay, so I think probably most people are familiar, at least in some sense, with what the complex representation theory of uh, a group is. So I'll, I'll take that as a, a given. And so this talk is concerned with two generalizations uh, of just the ordinary complex representation theory. So the first one is to categorify this. So that's kind of this horizontal direction. And while there's many notions of, of what a categorical representation theory should be. So I'll explain later the one that I'm choosing, but it's somehow the, just the most basic naive definition of what a categorical representation of a group should be. And while well, many people have worked on this subject before, uh, so well, somehow I won't have much to say new here. So what I'm really interested in is the generalization where I replace the complex representation theory with what I'll call the real category, excuse me, real representation theory. And so this is, well, capital real is different than little real. So this is kind of capital real in the sense of ATIA. And I'll talk about that in detail and what follows. And so then the kind of the heart of the talk will be what happens when we categorify and well, realify. So uh, roughly I'll spend quite a bit of time on one since maybe it's less familiar. And by the time we formulate one in the correct way, this categorification will be kind of quite clear. Okay, and then well, hopefully at the end, I can talk about some applications. So the first one is to the construction of unoriented topological field theories. And the second one, well, it's actually not an application, but rather a conjecture about whether the characters that arise from this real categorical representation theory can be seen as some kind of real generalization of Hopkins, Kuhn, Ravenel characters for uh, well, higher chromatic, Moravec K theory, for example. Um, just kind of in two lines, so what are the takeaways of this talk? So one is that this, this real perspective, which is a priori a kind of completely algebraic thing, is kind of manifested topologically in terms of passing from oriented to unoriented topology. And so this is, I would say, the kind of main maybe motto of the talk. And the second one, which is kind of meshing with the, the previous talk actually, is that well, this topological perspective is clarifying things about the representation theory. So in, in this talk, the particular thing that we are getting is some kind of more refined or generalized versions of secondary traces okay, or iterated traces sometimes they're called. Okay, so anyway, that's the, the gist. So let's get started. So first I want to spend a bit of time motivating uh, before we say what real representation theory is, why you might care about it. So I'll give uh, two kind of distinct motivations. So the first one is topological coming from Atiyah's real K theory. So usually called KR. So if you remember, so if you start with X, a topological space, then, well, I need to give some additional data to X to talk about its KR theory. I should give it an involution. Yeah, I'll call that so Z2 action, I call that involution omega, say. Yeah, and then uh, the KR theory of X, 
is built not from complex vector bundles on X, but rather complex vector bundles together with an anti-linear lift of this involution omega. So the KR of X is built from, so in the usual way that K theory is built, from complex vector bundles with a, a C anti-linear lift of omega. Okay, so there, there's something like a twisted Z2 equivariant vector bundles where this twist is uh, this anti-linearity operation conjugation. Okay, so this is the, the kind of standard KR theory, but the way that you can really see real representation theory is if you look for the correct equivariant generalization. And this, well, part of it was due to a Tia Siegel, but the kind of main or maybe full generalization, I would say, is due to Karubi. So Karubi considers uh, what I'll call a Z2 graded group. Okay, so I have my uh, group G hat. It has a surjective homomorphism to Z2, which for me is the multiplicative group. Oops, like so. Okay, and then you can talk about G equivariant K theory kind of with respect to this chosen uh, short exact sequence. Okay, so if you want to look at the we'll code G equivariant KR. So now instead of looking at a space with an involution, I look at G hat acting on my space X. And I look at complex vector bundles where I lift the action of elements of G linearly and elements in the non trivial coset anti linearly. So then I look at complex vector bundles. V over X with a lift of this G hat action, which well is either linear or anti-linear uh, depending on pi. Okay, so this Z2 grading here is kind of just controlling the linearity, anti-linearity of the lift. Okay, so this is I mean, the notation, it's not my fault. This is the standard notation. So the, the, this really depends on this choice of uh, G hat here, but somehow it's not indicated in this notation. Okay, so this is a kind of first indication of, well, we should generalize to, from studying groups to Z2 graded groups and look at representations or actions where this linearity is just, well, tracked by this uh, homomorphism pi. Okay, so let me give a completely second or completely different uh, direction. So this is coming from uh, symmetries in quantum mechanics. Okay, so, so well, any quantum mechanical system, it should have a, a Hilbert space uh, of states. So I'll pick H. So this is a complex separable Hilbert space. Okay, and well, the states in the system aren't actually vectors in this Hilbert space, but rather they're points in the projective space. Okay, so I can form the projective space on this Hilbert space. So this is the maybe state space. Okay, and this uh, well, projective space comes equipped with a function which I'll call the like, probability transition function, function. Okay, so I'll call this T for transition. So it's a function on pairs of states and it spits out a non-negative real number and it just measures the probability of one state transitioning to another. So I take say two uh, normalized or unit norm vectors and I send them to the Hilbert space pairing, and then I take its well, norm square. And so the kind of quantum mechanical system up to like time evolution and so on, the kind of key pieces of information are, well, this state space and this function, uh, oh, binary function on the state space. And so the theorem that I'll use as motivation, this goes back to Wigner. So 
Wigner states, well, this theorem states that any symmetry, oops, any symmetry of this pair of the state space and this function, meaning I have a distant or a kind of T preserving function from the projective space to itself. So any symmetry lifts to either a, a linear or anti-linear symmetry of the Hilbert space. Okay, so in particular, if you have a group of symmetries acting on your quantum system, so meaning there's a homomorphism from that group to the symmetry group of this, then that group is canonically Z2 graded, meaning I can just, well, again, the Z2 grading is just tracking the linearity or anti-linearity of the action. Okay, so that's the first point. So symmetries are canonically Z2 graded. Okay, and secondly, coming from the fact that, well, if we have a, a homomorphism into a symmetry here, this theorem is stating that it lifts to a symmetry upstairs. Okay, but that's also saying that the symmetry group, it's not only Z2 graded, but it's kind of canonically centrally extended. Okay, because, well, we need to lift from the Hilbert space to the uh, projective space. And so that gives us the central extension. So it's a bit more subtle. It's not quite a central extension, but it's what I'll call a twisted central extension. Okay, and well, the twisting is coming from this anti-linearity, but we'll see this later, so I, I don't wanna discuss it now. But so the main point is that if I have a symmetry in quantum mechanics, it's a Z2 graded group and uh, it comes with some kind of a central extension. And maybe I should say, so we saw this in the KR perspective, but if I want to twist KR theory, then I would see the analog of uh, part two here. So I can see both one and two in each of these topological and physical motivation. Okay, so this is the, just some motivation for at least two places where you might uh, want to consider this graded representation theory or real representation theory. Okay, so first thing I want to do is I want to switch uh, settings a little bit to avoid some kind of annoying signs. So in what follows, I want to avoid anti-linear things. Okay, and so I'll do this by, instead of talking about linear anti-linear maps, I'll talk about maps from a vector space to its dual or vector space to its original. Okay, so I'm gonna replace everywhere complex conjugation with taking linear duals. So I'll just write it like dual. Okay, and I, well, I could have done each of these KR examples and quantum mechanic examples using uh, duals instead of complex conjugation, but maybe it's a bit less familiar that way. Um, okay, so let's give a definition. So I fix once and for all an extension of G by Z2. Okay, and I have this map pi here, that, which tracks the, the homomorphism to Z2. Okay, then I say that a real representation of G, so that's with respect to this fixed chosen data G hat. So this is the following information. So first of all, it's a complex vector space V, which I'll always assume to be finite dimensional. Okay, and secondly, it's a bunch of maps from either V to V or V to V dual, depending on uh, which coset the element of G hat lives in. So I have maps I'll call row of omega. So these either go from V to V, that's if pi of omega is one, so it lives in the group G, or it goes from the dual of V to V otherwise. And so if I wanted to keep doing this anti-linear perspective, then instead of taking duals, I would just take complex conjugate. Okay, but it's somehow 
a bit later, it's annoying if there's conjugates floating around. Okay, so we'll see this type of behavior a lot. So I want to give this a notation. So I'll write this as pi of omega kind of left superscript of V. Okay, so this is just a notation for V or V dual depending on uh, what pi of omega is. Okay, and so now I need to also give some coherence condition. And if you think about it, there's only one possible choice that makes sense. And it's the following one. Looks a bit complicated, but it's not so complicated. Okay, so I require this composition rule to hold for any two group elements in G hat. Okay, so what is this kind of disaster here? So I follow the notation here. And so if this is one, I don't do anything. If it's minus one, I take the linear dual. And here I just either take the map or it's inverse. Okay, so this is just a well, kind of direct way of saying I take the well, linear dual of what the representation would do. Okay, and you can check that well, there's, there's really no other choice what you could possibly write for this compatibility condition just by looking at the domains and codomains of these maps. Okay, so just as a sanity check, let's do one example. So let's take the trivial or split case where G hat is just a product of my kind of underlying group with Z2 and pi is the canonical projection map. Okay, so in this case, a real representation, this is the same thing as a complex representation of G with a symmetric non-degenerate G invariant bilinear form. It, namely, I take say the generator of Z2 and I look at the map row of that generator. It defines me a map from the representations dual to the original and I can think of that as a bilinear form. Okay. And we know from, well, just classical representation theory, once I choose a symmetric bilinear form like so, uh, it defines the representation for me over the field R. This is, so this is the same thing as a representation of G over the field R. Okay, so when I take this kind of very simple example, then I just get back the representation theory over R which is good for something which is called real. Okay, and you can think this is like when you take KR theory of a space with trivial involution, it's KO. Okay, so like I said, I don't want to kind of focus this talk on representation theory. So I want to kind of start extracting the topological information as soon as possible. And the way to do this is to look at the characters of such representations. Okay, so let's look at characters. Okay, so if I have uh, my real representation row, then I define its character as follows. So it's a function on the group G, not G hat, lands in C. So I take some element G and I take its trace of the endomorphism of V that uh, G generates. Okay. So first thing to notice is, well, I can't possibly define this for elements well, in the non-trivial coset because I don't know how to take the trace of a map from a vector space to its dual. Okay, but so that means I just take the trace where I can. So that's on the subgroup G. And so then as a function, this is just the character of the underlying complex representation. Okay, but the interesting information is there's some kind of additional descent data on this character when I think of it as coming from a real representation. Okay, so it satisfies the, um, this invariance condition, which says that when I conjugate up to a sign, uh, this character is invariant. Okay, so this is for all omega now in G hat. Okay, so in particular, if omega lives in G, this is just the standard conjugation invariance of traces. Okay, so that's a completely familiar thing. 
So the interesting thing happens is when G is living in the non-trivial coset, well, it's not invariant under conjugation, but first I need to take the inverse of the group element. Okay, and so this inverse is somehow kind of the key to the entire talk. So this is the, the first part we're seeing some kind of topology showing up. Okay, so how should we think about this? Meaning, if you're explaining this to a topologist, what's the, well, maybe a good way to, to think about it. So first let's think, well, what do we do in the complex case? So there we, we use that, well, if I take my group G, okay, I form the groupoid with one element and then I form the loop groupoid of that. So that's what LBG is here. So I take this explicitly, it's just the category of functors from BZ which I think of as the circle to BG. So that's what I mean by loops into BG. Uh, so well, it's the familiar fact that this is the equivalent to the conjugation groupoid. So G acts on itself by conjugation and I take the action groupoid. Okay, so well, this action by G hat on G isn't by conjugation, but it's some well called say real conjugation. I conjugate by G and I conjugate inverse by the non-trivial coset. Okay, so this has a, a nice topological inter interpretation. So to see it, so first of all, we think of, um, so this homomorphism from G hat to Z2. So I want to think of it topologically as classifying a double cover. BG hat goes to BZ2, so that's B pi. Okay, so such a functor classifies a double cover and that double cover is exactly just this map BG to BG hat. Okay, so this is a kind of categorical double cover. And for example, what's the non-trivial deck transformation here? Well, I just conjugate the morphisms by any element in the non-trivial coset of G hat. Okay, that's an explicit model for the non-trivial deck transformation. Okay, so we have this uh, double cover here. And now I want to look at uh, the following space. So I'll call it L pi of BG hat. Okay, so first I take the loops into BG. Okay, and now this category has two canonical Z2 actions now. Okay, I have the Z2 action coming from the non-trivial deck transformation. And then I also have the kind of orientation reversal or reflection of the circle, just send well, negation on the group Z. Okay, and I'm gonna take the diagonal quotient by that action. Okay, so this is the diagonal action. Okay, and so this you can think of as a kind of unoriented loop groupoid. So unoriented because, well, it's involving the orientation reversal of this uh, circle BZ. Okay, and so the claim is that, uh, well, this is somehow the right generalization of the loop groupoid in this Z2 graded setting. Okay, so maybe I'll state just a kind of easy lemma. So, well, we gave a kind of abstract definition, but there's a completely concrete model of what this unoriented loop groupoid is. It's just equivalent to the uh, group G where I take the um, action groupoid, not by conjugation of G hat, but by real conjugation. So this means an element omega in G hat acts by, well, exactly this term appearing in this conjugation invariance. So here G lives in G, omega lives in G hat. Okay, so that's, this is how G hat acts on G and then I take the action groupoid for that action. Okay, so if we go back to this equation, now we have a kind of topological way of thinking about this. We can think of it as saying that real characters, these are functions on G which are invariant under this real conjugation action. So those are just locally constant functions 
on the unoriented loop group work. Okay, so just rephrasing. So chi rho, this is a locally constant function. Okay, that's just a, a, a way of encoding this uh, invariance condition. Okay, so this is the kind of first hint that we should really start thinking about uh, these unoriented versions of uh, loop spaces. Okay, so at the moment it looks, uh, well, it's a little bit formal. So in the end, all we did is reformulate some rather simple calculation in terms of some topological ideas. So is there any kind of meat to this uh, idea? So we can see that already it's kind of a good idea when we think about not just this Z2 graded generalization, but also bring in these central extensions that we, we spoke about in this quantum mechanics example. So what about extensions? Okay, so I'll use throughout the talk that well, representations of a central extension, these are the same thing as projective representations of the group. Okay, so instead of talking about extensions, I'll talk about projective representations. So let's fix some co-cycle, which is gonna be our sure multiplier. And I take a degree two twisted co-cycle on VG hat. So this is my notation for, I take uh, a co-cycle and then I twist by the local system determined by the double cover BG to BG hat. Okay, so that's, this is a well, co-cycle for that complex of twisted co-chains. Okay, and then, well, I can use this co-cycle to deform the coherence condition in the, in the notion of a representation. So I say that a theta twisted real representation of G is, well, one and two are as before. So I still have my vector space. I have, have maps from V dual to V and V to V, but now I deform this coherence condition. So I require that when I compose rho of omega two with rho of omega one, well, I don't get this naive thing on the nose, but I get it up to multiplication by this co-cycle. Um, like so. Okay. And so, for example, you can see already why we need to use twisted co-cycles instead of just ordinary co-cycles, right? So if we take this coherence condition and check what happens when we apply a third group element to it, uh, well, the kind of higher coherence that needs to be the identity there uh, is true if and only if this is a twisted co-cycle because eventually we're gonna have to pull this through a, um, one of these endomorphisms and that will, will change signs according to whether it takes duals or not. So change a, insert a inverse according to if we take duals. Okay, so now we can repeat our calculation and check, well, what kind of invariance does a character of a twisted representation satisfy? So we have the following already kind of nasty looking formula. So it's not equal to, uh, we don't have this real conjugation invariance anymore, but it's now deformed by the choice of theta. And this deformation is a bit ugly. So it says, I take theta of GG inverse. I'll explain the notation in a minute. Like so. Okay, so the first term appears uh, only if omega is kind of living in the odd part. And then it appears with exponent minus one. Otherwise, this term is just not there. Okay, and then you have this ratio of co-cycles applied to all well, this kind of funny combination. Okay, so this is just some direct calculation, um, but it would be nice to have some meaning of this. And so this, this loop space perspective gives us a, a candidate for meaning. 
and it turns out the, the, the meaning is, is true. So we want to give a, a better explanation of what this is. Not just how to compute it, but kind of what, what's the meaning of this term. So here's the first theorem. So this is with uh, bearing Nui. So the, the theorem says that, uh, well, in a sentence, we obtain this coefficient by some kind of orientation twisted transgression of our original co-cycle. Okay, so let me say this uh, precisely. So the statement is that push-pull along the following correspondence diagram So I'll explain once I finish writing. Okay, so what is this diagram? So, okay, so I have this uh, BZ times this original loop groupoid of G. And then I have this diagonal Z2 action, well, it acts by reflection here and this diagonal action here. Okay, well, I can use, there's a kind of categorical evaluation map, which well, roughly takes something in the circle and something here and just projects it to its uh, image. So here I think of BG hat as the quotient of BG by Z2. Okay, so I have this evaluation map. And then on the other side, I have this projection map to the second factor. Okay, and that by definition, when I take that Z2 quotient, that's this unoriented loop groupoid. Okay, so what's the kind of key feature of this diagram that makes it different from a ordinary transgression diagram? Well, <clears throat> if we look at the fibers of this projection map, well, they're kind of canonically two copies of the circle with opposite orientations and then identified. So canonically, it's a copy of the circle, but we now have no orientation of the circle. Okay, even if, if we somehow start with an orientation here. Okay, and so this lack of orientation here is going to be responsible for introducing a twist in the push forward map along here. Okay, so the theorem to finish stating it. So I have this diagram, if I push pull along it, I get a map, um, a co-chain map. Tau pi. So it goes from twisted co-chains on BG hat. So I take something here, I pull it back, I push it forward. So it's gonna land in untwisted co-chains on this unoriented loop groupoid. Okay, so we have a cochain map. And moreover, it has a couple of kind of distinguishing features. So the main thing is that it's not just some abstract map is we have a completely combinatorial model for it. So I'll just say that it has a explicit expression. And maybe just to say it, if pi happens to be trivial, meaning the, the grading G hat is the same as the group G, so there's no kind of anti-linear thing happening, then this reduces to uh, Willerton's transgression map. Hey, and well, this is useful because Willerton's map is showing up kind of all over the place in oriented topological field theory calculations. Okay, and so somehow, uh, if, if our map didn't reduce to Willertons on the nose, but rather is just a kind of homotopy equivalent to Willertons, uh, then we'd have to track these homotopies in all our calculations. Okay, so this is uh, the first result of the talk. And well, maybe we should say, um, so just then by observation, 
this invariance condition, well, is exactly captured by this map in its lowest degree. Uh, so what is it? Uh, omega, and then I have kind of applied at the point G. Like so. <clears throat> okay, so this to me says that it's worthwhile to think seriously about this unoriented loop groupoid. Because, well, now I have some just completely topological description of what this is. So I can kind of maybe forget a little bit about what the guts of it look like and just think about it well, in terms of this setting here. Okay. And so, well, we can prove a theorem. So I'm not sure who this theorem is. Presumably someone knows it, but it's at least included uh, in my paper with bearing, I guess. So it says that if I look at the twisted K theory, of a point. So this is just a fancy way of saying the real representation ring. Okay, and then I complexify this. So I have this character map, which maps me to functions which exactly satisfy this condition. So I'll write them geometrically as follows. So I have my representation and I send it to its character. So this map is an isomorphism. Let me explain. So what is, what is this space? So first and foremost, it's just the space of functions on G which satisfy this condition. Okay, but we want to kind of carry this geometric picture through. So how should I think about this? So this transgress cocycle, tau pi theta hat. So this is now a one cocycle untwisted on this loop groupoid with say C star coefficients. Okay, so I can think of such a co-cycle as defining a flat line bundle on this groupoid. Okay, and it's, well, just a concrete thing. If I have two elements in my group, G and uh, omega G pi omega G inverse. Okay, I have a path between them given by omega. Then all of the fibers of this line bundle are trivialized and the holonomy is just given by this uh, co-cycle. So this map here is just multiplication by the corresponding map, uh, omega g. And so then a flat section, well, is assignment of numbers which make this diagram commute. Well, that's exactly such a function. Okay, so uh, right now, it maybe seems a bit like it's just too much notation and you're forcing the geometry in. But we'll see in the categorified case, if you don't take this perspective, then you're just immediately swamped with calculations. Okay? And so we can apply this maybe kind of sledgehammer uh, in the categorical case uh, to get the results we want. Okay. So this is the kind of end of the summary about uh, the non-categorified case. So, uh, I'll talk now about the categorified case, but I guess also if there's questions now would be a, a reasonable time. Okay. So first of all, the, this work is kind of motivated by uh, earlier work that was done in the complex case. So this started, I mean, somehow it goes back to already Grotendieck, but maybe this representation theoretic point of view started with Barrett and McKay, um, Crane and Yetter, and then maybe kind of very seriously by El Guetta and then many people after this. But these are well, kind of everything I'm doing. I, I knew this work beforehand, so it's building off this. Okay, so how do we want to categorify this, uh, this real representation theory? So I'm gonna make the simplifying assumption today that I don't wanna categorify the group 
it just muddles the, the message I'm trying to get. So I'm going to keep my group as uncategorified. So you could replace everything with two groups, any kind of two groups you want and what follows, but I don't want to do this today. Okay, so instead I want to focus on categorifying uh, complex vector spaces with linear dual, right? This is the, the target of all my real representations. And so I, I need to understand what should the target be in this categorical setting. Okay, and there's, well, once you pass from a, a category like vector spaces to a bi-category, you now have, well, maybe three notions of what a contravariant functor should be, right? You can have contravariant functors that switch the direction of one cells, two cells, or both. Okay, and we need to make a choice uh, which one we use. And just empirically, uh, all of the examples I know, they, they arise from a single choice. So we'll use uh, what Shulman calls uh, by categories with weak duality involution. Okay, so what this is, so first of all, I have a bi-category, which I'll call it C, and today I'm always going to take it to be C linear, but that's not strictly speaking necessary. And then, so this is categorifying this category, or rather the categorical replacement, and then replacing this dual functor is a functor, which I'll still call dual, and it goes from, well, the co-opposite to the original category. So this is the category by category I get by reversing only the two cells of C. Okay, so that's the, that's the setting I, I choose and I, I only work in this setting. Okay, so what are the kind of two main examples? So if I take C to be the by category of categories, then well, such a structure is given by just taking opposite category, opposite functor, opposite natural transformation. Okay, so that only changes the direction of the natural transformations. Uh, a second choice, which is more kind of representation theoretic. So for example, I can take the Merida by category of say finite dimensional semi-simple algebras. So these are algebras by modules and intertwiners, yeah, semi-simple. Okay, and here for my duality involution, I take the functor that takes opposites of algebras, takes the linear dual of by modules and well, it doesn't do anything to intertwiners. Okay, so this also defines uh, such a structure. Okay, so, well, this one is extremely familiar, so that should tell you that, well, this is not an unreasonable uh, kind of structure, and this one also is, well, not maybe unfamiliar. So, um, it should be a kind of involution? Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, thank you. So, this thing is an involution, sorry, that's <laughs> the kind of key point. And so inv involution is, is in this bi-categorical sense, so I need to give higher data saying how it's an involution and higher coherence is on that data. But I'm gonna completely ignore that today. Yeah, thank you for that. That's a, certainly can't ignore that. Yep. Okay, so the, after we kind of formulated this non-categorical case in a particular way, it's very easy to just define what a categor real categorical representation is. Okay, so we don't have to think too hard about this. So a real categorical representation with twist alpha hat. So I've moved up a categorical level. And so now I need to, instead of take a twisted two co-cycle, I take a twisted three co-cycle. Okay, and let's just model it after our definition in the non-categorical case. So first of all, I have an object in C and I'm again, taking this by category, it's gonna be C linear because I want to talk about uh, twisted things. 
Okay, and then I have equivalences, rho of omega, that go from either the object to the object or the image of the object under the dual to the original object. Okay, so I just use the same notation. Okay, now I have the, I categorify the coherence condition to coherence data. So I have data of isomorphisms, two isomorphisms, omega two, omega one. So this guy goes from this composition to the composition of the row of the composition. Okay. Again, there's once we've chosen this duality that only swaps the direction of two cells, there's basically no choice for what this is. Okay. And then we need to add a coherence condition. Okay, and it's a kind of twisted two co-cycle condition. So I'll write it a bit informally, but you can probably guess what it is. Okay, so naively, without the twist, you would get this usual co-cycle condition. That's a one. Okay, but I deform this using alpha. Okay, so I multiply this by alpha hat of omega three, omega two, omega one. And so, I mean, technically this doesn't make sense, but you need to whisker it with the appropriate uh, equivalences here, but I'm just gonna ignore that. Okay, so it looks, well, you, once you see the, the definition in the classical case, you could have come up with this yourself if you had the reason to. Okay, so I want to, maybe I should give an example because it might seem a little bit uh, abstract. So here's a, a kind of typical place where these examples arise. So let's look at the following case. So let's take a, a polynomial W inside some polynomial ring, which I'll call R. Okay, and I'll assume say that W has a isolated singularity at the origin. Okay, so attached to this is a DG category of matrix vectorizations. So these are matrix vectorizations. Okay, and just I'll remind you, the objects are finite uh, rank free R modules together with maps between them that's kind of composed to the multiplication by W. So those are objects, morphisms are kind of the obvious square diagrams. And then the differential measures whether the, the square diagrams commute or not. Okay, so we can think it's like a, a complex of vector bundles on R, except for this differential is deformed by W. W zero, it's actually complex, otherwise it's W deformed. Okay, and so let's suppose that we have a G hat, a, a Z2 graded group that maps into the automorphism group of this uh, ring R. Okay, and it doesn't quite leave the potential invariant, but it does so up to a sign. So omega X on W by the sign uh, of omega. Okay, so this condition arises in physics. So this is called the orientifold uh, Lando Ginzburg condition. Um, so, oh, it's a standard thing, at least in the physics literature to, to look at this. And I should say, so if this sign were gone, this would just be what uh, mathematicians call orbifold Lando Ginzburg models. Okay, so this sign is really kind of going beyond this standard orbifold case. Okay, so um, then I can define a real categorical representation on this object. I think of it as living in C linear DG category, say. Okay, and I do two different things. 
So if I have an element in the group G, I just pull everything back by this, this group element. So I just, well, G acts on the ring, so it acts on free modules, it acts on the maps between them and so on. Okay, the interesting thing is if I apply it to omega, which is odd. Okay, so now what I do is the following. So I take a matrix factorization. Okay, I have this canonical dual functor, which because of the sign rule, the dual of a matrix factorization is canonically a matrix factorization of the negated potential. Okay, so there's no choice as to how you, as to this minus sign here. It's kind of determined by the Kajul rule. Okay, and now I can, well, luckily I have this map omega star, which changes the sign of the potential. And so in the end, it brings me back to a matrix factorization of W again. Okay, and then you can, well, you can define these coherence maps psi uh, in a straightforward way. So I should say this uh, example is studied in detail uh, by Spellman in his master's thesis. So uh, there's kind of lots of interesting homological algebra happens uh, when you look at conditions like this. Okay, so this is a, a well large class of examples that if you don't move outside the realm of categorical representation theory, you just can't study, well, simply because of this sign. Okay. So we have maybe 10 minutes left, so I should get to the, the punchline. So we saw that in the classical case, the, the key thing to see the topology was to look at the character theory, or maybe the most obvious way to see the topology. So what's the character theory for these categorical gadgets? Okay, and again, many people have studied this in the complex case. So it goes back to Bartlett, Yanter, Kapranov. Uh, in this group uh, representation theory point of view, but similar ideas are kind of around in work of say Benz v Nadler, uh, Toan Zozi, many other people. And just to connect to the last talk, so Campbell, Poncho. So, uh, so th this is all in the language of secondary or iterated traces. Okay, so somehow maybe it's useful to say why are these authors, well, at least some of them thinking about this. So both Ganter and Kapranov and Toan Vazozi so they were studying these uh, well, categorical characters or secondary traces to try to find some relation to character theories for elliptic cohomology. Okay, so some kind of higher chromatic version of K-theory. Um, and so somehow we're dealing with KR theory and well, just to hint at this application that I hope for is that this character theory that I'll talk about next has something to do with some kind of real version of elliptic cohomology. Okay, so that at least is touching on uh, the, some of the motivations of these two groups. Okay, um, so concretely, so what do we do? So I take rho a real categorical representation. Okay, so first thing I do is I form um, what's called the categorical character. So if we just go back for a minute and think, what do we do in the classical case? So the, the character is a function on G, which satisfies some kind of real conjugation invariance conditions. Okay, so to categorify this, we should expect we attach a vector space to each element of G, and now we define conjugation equivariance data on these vector spaces. Okay, and well, that works exactly as you would hope. So for each element G, this is in my group G, not G hat, I define a vector space, which is just all the two morphisms from the identity on V to rho of G. So it's 
I think of it in terms of diagrams, it's like this. Okay, and I just look at all two morphisms phi. Okay. And now I give data of this real conjugation invariance. Like so. Hey, and I think it's easiest to define this using uh, string diagrams. So let me take that point of view. So first case, so we should break it up into two cases. So one is omega lives in G and one is, it doesn't. Okay, so if omega lives in G, we're in the realm of the previous, previous authors. Let me just do the following. Okay, so I think of phi, it's a, a morphism from the identity to G. So I, identity is kind of invisible. I go like so. Okay, and so this map here is describing, or this diagram is describing what beta does to phi. Okay, so this is in the case when omega is in the group G. Okay, and so for example, I've emitted all this data here, but this, for example, is the map psi omega G, which is the coherence condition relating how uh, omega x, g x, and their product x. Okay, so I kind of I take my my morphism uh, phi and I just encircle it by omega, roughly. Okay, but something interesting happens in the non-trivial coset. So now we have, well, we we kind of have to come to grips with the fact that our involution on the category swaps the direction of two morphisms. Okay, so if I apply this involution to, to phi, it now maps from the empty or from the identity to G instead of from, sorry, it maps from G to the identity instead of the other way, sorry. Right, so originally it maps from the identity to row of G and now I read my diagrams up, it maps from G to the identity. Okay, so the only way I can close this diagram up is if I form, well, this cup. So that gives me a G inverse, omega inverse, omega. And so now I end up, you see kind of exactly where this conjugation comes, rather the inverse comes from in this uh, real setting. Okay, and well, I don't wanna mess up the diagram, but somehow, the way to think about this diagram here is that you're on two separate pieces of paper. So somehow the one side of the paper is labeled by the object V and the other side is labeled by V dual, right? And this omega, because it's living in the non-trivial coset is somehow telling you how to swap from one side of the paper to the other. Okay, and that's just some completely new phenomenon than in this complex case. Okay, so Here's the final two theorems. So, so the first theorem says that, well, these maps are almost satisfying the equivariance condition, but again, we have a twist coming into this, this story. So it says that the data of these vector spaces and all of the maps between them, they define a twisted vector bundle over this unoriented loop groupoid. Okay, and concretely what this means is if I compose two betas, well, I don't get what you think on the nose, but it differs exactly by this two co-cycle. Okay, and geometrically, I think of this two co-cycle as a gerb so I can talk about vector bundles twisted by a gerb and that's exactly what this is. Okay. And so uh, I wanted to give a indication. So this co-cycle is rather nasty. So here's the ex expression for what that, that, that co-cycle is. So it's not supposed to mean too much, just that it's a complicated thing. And so already in this once categorified setting, you see, we need some kind of topological way to think about this. 
if we just think about it directly in terms of what its expression is, then oh, you know you don't want to do calculations with this co-cycling. Okay, so in the uncategorified case, you could kind of get by without without thinking about the topology, but I think that in this uh, categorified case, you just can't get away with it, or I can't get away with it. Okay, so the final corollary. So so I'm I'll be done in one minute. So now we apply this sledgehammer of character theory in the, the non-categorified case. Okay, so I have this, uh, well, twisted vector bundle, and I can take characters or traces of twisted vector bundles. Okay, so I do this and I get the secondary or iterated trace of rho. Okay, so I'll call it the real secondary trace of rho. Is the well character of this vector bundle, twisted vector bundle from the previous part. Okay, and just by general machinery, it lands in this kind of weird looking vector space. It's some kind of iterated loop space, uh, or rather flat sections of a line bundle over an iterated loop space. Okay, so to end the talk, I just want to unpack what does this mean and kind of what topology do we see from it? Okay, so first thing is, well, we have this groupoid and I know how to take loops into a groupoid. So that there's kind of no question with. The second thing, so this is a now, remember, untwisted to co-cycle on the loop, unoriented loop space. Okay, and I can just take its usual oriented transgression. That's what the map tau is. Okay, so this thing which results is a one co-cycle on this iterated loop space. Okay, so it defines a, a flat line bundle. I take sections of that. Okay, but to see kind of really what's happening, we need well, a nice model for what this groupoid is, and it has one. So this groupoid is equivalent to the following action groupoid. Uh, G hat where, so this G hat two. So this is not quite the commuting pairs in G hat, but somehow the real commuting pairs. Okay, so this is the set of all G omegas that live in G times G hat, such that, well, it's fixed by real conjugation. Okay, and now you can see what is this map rho? Well, if I apply rho to a, an element like this, then this, this condition is saying that this map beta has the same domain and range. And so I can take the trace of that under some kind of finiteness condition. Okay, and that trace is exactly this secondary trace. Okay, so this guy breaks up further into two sectors. I'll call them according to what the sign of omega is. So first of all, if omega is mapping to one, then we know that, well, this condition just becomes the commuting pair condition. Okay, and so we can think of, well, this groupoid, when I restrict to that sector, it's just the, the space of G bundles uh, over a two torus. Uh, Okay, so this groupoid in that sector is just G bundles over the two torus. All right, I just need to remember holonomy. The two torus has pi one Z times Z. And so I just need to remember a pair of commuting elements in G. Okay, and so the last sector I'll call the Klein sector. So we look at those pairs pi of omega uh, which is minus one. And so we get the condition that omega G inverse, omega inverse is G. Okay, and that we recognize exactly as the relation for a presentation of fundamental group of the Klein bottle. And so what we get is that the kind of relevant moduli space is the following. It's a, a slightly complicated, but 
I think the idea is clear. So it's G hat bundles over the Klein bottle. Okay, and I require a certain kind of twisted orientation of them. So these are, so its objects are G hat bundles. This is a G hat bundle. Okay, and I require the data of, so I can look at G hat quotient by G on Z2. So this is the associated double cover. Okay, and I require that double cover be the orientation double cover of the, the Klein bottle. So this is just, the, in other words, it's the torus. These are as double covers of the Klein model. Okay, and so we see that well, from this real categorical representation theory, we not only get functions on moduli space of bundles over torus, like we do in the classical case, and like you somehow expect from elliptic homology, but you also get some completely new sector which are these functions on moduli spaces coming from Klein bottles. Okay, so this is the kind of first indication that well, we saw that, that in the non-categorical case, you get unoriented loop groups. But now as you move up, you really get kind of mapping spaces uh, from unoriented targets, uh, or unoriented domains like the Klein bottle. Um, so I'm a little bit over. So maybe uh, I guess I'll have to skip the applications, but uh, I think now's I guess a good place to stop. All right. Well, thank you for the beautiful talk. Uh, yeah. I would like to hear a bit about the applications. Should. Uh... I mean, I'm happy to do this, but I don't know if other people have questions and have to leave first. Oh, no, well, or, maybe you. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, if there's no other questions, I'm happy to explain it, but. Why don't you explain it? People sure. can ask questions during. Okay, okay. So maybe I'll say, um, okay. So the first one is, is actually an application in that it's a theorem. So, um, so there's new TFTs attached to this. So let me just state this uh, a bit informally. So the claim is that, so roughly um, real categorical representation theory is what I'll call unoriented diecraft witten theory. Okay, so um, diecraft witten theory, this is a, a well-studied, I mean, somehow it's kind of the most mathematically studied uh, notion of TQFT. So it's usually an oriented theory. Okay, and so what, what does this statement mean? So if we think in terms of the cobordism hypothesis, so uh, what you can say is that, um, so there exists, a TQFT, I'll call it Z G hat alpha hat. So I take my Z2 graded group and this twisted co-cycle and I get a functor from the unoriented boredism category. Okay, so no orientations. And I send it to, I, for example, I can take this kind of Merida tri category of tensor categories. So these are tensor categories, bimodules, so on. Okay, and this theory, well, by cobordism hypothesis, I just need to tell you what it does to the point, and I need to give you appropriate equivariance information. Okay, so it sends this to the, say, G graded vector spaces with a kind of co monoidal coherence twisted by alpha. So alpha here is the underlying untwisted co cycle of G. Okay, and so all of the information then is I need to give this some kind of action of O3. Okay, and there's two pieces to O3. So I have SO3 and the group of connected components, which are Z2. Okay, 
And so SO3, this is talking about the underlying oriented theory. So that thing is basically understood. So I could just kind of ignore this. So the new information you need in the unoriented theory is to understand what this, uh, well, how this Z2 is acting. Okay, and so this statement, which is the precise version of this statement is the following. So I have to go to a new page, sorry. So if I look at module categories over G, so this is a monoidal category. I look at its module categories with appropriate finiteness conditions. Okay, I get an induced Z2 action coming from this uh, Z2 action here. Okay, and the claim is that homotopy fixed points for that are exactly the category of real representations. So this, I'll just write it informally, it's category of real representations, like so. Okay, and so all of this information of the lift G hat, the lift alpha hat, all of these transgression formulas, they appear in saying what the Z2 action is. So the, the Z2 action is, is really quite complicated. Uh, and that's kind of, again, where the power of this transgression point of view shows up is that we don't have to check by hand that all these coherence conditions hold. Many of them hold for topological reasons. And so this is the sense in which, uh, well, that, that, that's what I mean by this statement here. And so for example, I can compute things in this TQFT using character theory of real representations. Okay, and otherwise I, I don't have fantastic ways to compute things there. So that's a, just a kind of concrete, well, it's only so concrete, but it's relatively concrete. Um, so the second one, this is again, not a real application. It's, it's basically a conjecture or maybe Conjecture is even too much, maybe a question. So um, is there a real version of elliptic cohomology uh, whose associated HKR character theory is, well, basically the character theory that I said is as above. Okay, that's also not a precise thing. So it, it's known that in the ordinary case, so with just ordinary elliptic cohomology and this gantter kapranov character theory, in the end, it's just an analogy. So uh, you can, for example, you can write down uh, all the induction maps in both the HKR setting and gantter kapranov setting, and they all match on the nose. But in the end, it's, it's just an analogy. Okay, and so you, I don't think you can hope for anything more here, but in this character theoretic point of view, you can also write down all of these induction maps. And so you get some kind of very constrained structure. And then the question is, so is there some kind of real elliptic cohomology theory, which somehow is built from elliptic curves with the orientation reversing involution, whose associated character theory kind of is modeled by this representation theoretic toy model? in the same way that Ganter and Campano do. So again, I don't know how to construct this theory. I don't know what its H character, character theory would be, but I know kind of extremely constraining uh, conditions on what it should be. So that's hopefully maybe it will be an application one day, but right now it's just a, a maybe question. Well, those are, those would be some interesting applications. Mm -hmm. um, are there other questions about the talk? Ha have you thought about, I mean, is this categorical representation theory, does it have to do with, uh, are there obstructions to these twists via say Brouwer groups or anything like that? Have you thought about that? Uh, so 
Oh, okay. The short answer is not seriously. Um, I, I think I, I, on I, right now I can't say anything intelligent. I mean, yeah. I guess somehow, like the the my my thought is to to go back to this Donovan Karubi. So I mean, they have the Brouwer group, but over R. So I mean, I know there's a capital real version of this, but I don't know what's the right. I, I don't know. I mean, I just haven't thought about what the the kind of one higher level thing is. So I, I can't say. Any other questions? Well, in that case, I suggest we thank Matt again for his uh, beautiful talk. And that will. Thank you so much. Thank you thank very you. much.